Well, thank you very much for coming to our new exhibit in the Marie Louise Trichet Gallery here at Wisdom House. This afternoon, we are opening the exhibit of Bramble and Bramble with the wonderful title of Remnants, Glyphs, and as Pam told me, showed me how to pronounce Palm, Palm, And there, it's, I'm leading up to them to do the explaining. But just to give you a little background on the gallery, the gallery started here at, at Wisdom House in 1994. And since that time, we've had the opportunity to have some wonderful exhibits of local, national, and international artists. And about our two artists today, let me tell you a few things. First of all, Pam is a painter whose work is represented in public and private collections. And she received her MFA in painting from Columbia University and has been a member of the Art and Art History Department of UConn since 1989. And I'm just so happy to say that it was through Pam and the Arts Project at UConn that I had the opportunity to have an exhibit of my photography and poetry a, a few years ago. So I'm very grateful that they uh, extended that invitation to me. I like what Pam had to say about her work. She said, I make paintings that explore my interest in how the process of painting, the activity itself, establishes content. That the activity, in the act of the painting, the content is discovered, or would we might say, reveals itself. That, that takes a lot of submission and a lot of faith in the art that you are in the process of creating. In relation to Frank and, and his work, Frank has been painting for over 30 years, and at in this time frame, he has done abstract and figurative art. His travels, particularly in Central America, have had a profound effect on the way he views abstract art. They pay, uh, when uh, Frank talks about his paintings, he says, or about his work in general, he says, they strive for a combination of immediacy and reverie. They strive for a combination of immediacy and reverie. And I'll have to be very honest with you. When I read those words, I said to myself, that not only describes Frank's work, that describes Frank. <laughs> <laughs> that describes the gifts of Frank Bramble. Oh, stop it. Immediacy <laughs> and reverie. And so, and also at the present time, Frank is on the, on the faculty of uh, Fairfield Prep in, here in Fairfield, Connecticut. Because so many of you are involved in the arts or are definitely supporters of the arts, you know that when you enter a gallery, the room becomes another world. And every time we have a new exhibit in our gallery, we invite people who come here to enter into different worlds. So we're so happy to have this particular exhibit here right now because in this season of transitions, this is an exhibit that invites you into transition and invites you into transitioning. So dare you enter the exhibit. Uh -huh. So to tell you more about the exhibit, here are Frank and Pam. Everybody, I'm just thrilled to see all these people here. Um, it's interesting, when uh, Brian and Mary came, uh, I think Mary said, are you a little bit nervous? And I said, well, you know, I stand in front of groups of students all day long, and that's, that's what I do, but talking about my own work, uh, yes, I think I am a little nervous. <laughs> so, what we thought we would do is uh, share with you a, a few paintings, um, many of which are not in the exhibit, but also to share a few um, inspirational works, works of art that we look at or have had some kind of influence um, on us. And um, you will see some similarities, but I think you'll also see some very uh, distinct uh, differences. A conversation rather than a talk. This first slide is just to give you a sense of uh, the kind of work that we are doing now. I have been very, very interested in the creative process, as Joanne alluded to. And it comes directly out of something known as the Abstract Expressionist Movement, where it's actually the gesture, the mark making, the activity of painting becomes the content. And, but that is easier said than done, because it does take a giant leap of faith, because you really start with hardly anything, and you go through several phases where an individual work of art 
is wrestling with you as you're trying to make it kind of settle down. For me, what I'm looking for is a surface that is energized, that has um, a, a kind of motion and movement, but that that movement has been stopped, arrested. And I like it to be somewhat meditative. Uh, I'd like people to be able to look into the painting and get a sense of quietness, while at the same time there's that residue of struggle that existed while this was coming into being. There's a Gustave Duray illustration of Satan, Lucifer, falling from a great height. And Milton talks about many days that he falls all the way, all the way to hell. There's a space between. In Beowulf, the poem talks about the hero going into the gap of death. The space between, the space between the two armies, between the two foes, the space between. The painting, the art for me, is that space between. It's a contemplative space. If you look at, there's a thing in the Greek rite of Christianity, right, in which the people gather outside and the ceremony of the mass or whatever's going on takes place at an altar behind something, behind an iconostasis, a screen. And there it reserves its mysteries. And you hear most of it rather than see most of it. And it's that sense that somehow there is something that we encounter that is that moment of mystery that is that liminal space just before one steps off between one reality and another reality. What is that other reality? It's not that the painting is the reality. It's hopefully the clue to some, some reality. It's, it's the pieces. It's the parts. It's the little... It's, it's left over. It's, yes. It's the right, and, the, and the idea that there is the surface that you're looking on at and that there's something underneath there that once was but is now gone, but perhaps it still comes to the fore, still echoes, echoes forward. So all three of these, these words have that idea of something that's left over, something that once was, or is in the state of, uh, of transforming. I'm going to show a couple of examples um, of works of art, of artists in particular, who uh, mean a lot to me. And some of these images may be rather surprising for those of you who, who, who know me. Um, because many of these come from the uh, 12th, 13th, and 14th century, and they are um, Italian or Northern Renaissance paintings. Most of them are uh, religious in nature, uh, quite religious in nature, such as this uh, triptych by Robert Capon, possibly by Robert Capon. The reason why it means so much to me is because of the stillness and the spirituality that one gets when sitting in front of a painting such as this. And more functionally, uh, the idea that there are three parts to the painting, which give you three separate stories. And um, when, I'm, when I'm working, because I have layers of paint going on at different times, and I'm incising back in and adding and taking and abstracting, uh, I work on several works of art at the same time. And a few years ago, I had several of them leaning up against the wall and I was struck by the relationship that they had to one another. And I thought, you know, it's not that I want the image to continue from one panel to the next in a very expected way, but I want there to be the kind of narrative that you get in a triptych or a diptych that is so much a part of the art of, of this time. Whether it be in three separate panels or in something like this, such as Masaccio's The Tribute Money, what you call a continuous narration, where there are the same figures found um, in this painting. And uh, so, you know, you notice that there's uh, the, the center portion, but then this fellow here is here and over here, he is paying the money and this guy moved over here. So on the same, on the same surface, there is this uh, story that unfolds, not unlike um, the narrative of a book that you would, that you would read. So I got increasingly interested in this idea that not just that you read a painting, but that there's this uh, relationship that can exist from one uh, canvas to the next. And then finally, the idea of the worn surface. Uh, several years ago now, 
uh, over 15 years ago, uh, I, Frank and I went to Italy, and I was on a research grant to see certain frescoes that were in Padua and Assisi and Arezzo. And these are very old, obviously. They're from the 1400s, early 1400s. And their surfaces, as you can see, are really quite, quite worn. And I love that. I love that sense of time, that kind of alteration that, that occurs, and how it intersperses with uh, the, the rest of the image. And the geometry and the colors are also quite, quite nice as well. Uh, and this has both. This has both that continued narration. We have the same figures in both spaces, but you then also have the fact that the surface itself is really quite worn. Amazing meditative quality. Um, I thought, how can you be an abstract painter, somebody where gesture and mark making is so significant to the final image, uh, but how can you somehow make it quiet and, and, uh, and peaceful? So of course there's Rothko, Mark Rothko, uh, who probably did a pretty good job with that. Rothko. They're beautiful, the way that those colors just shimmer. And for those of you who have been fortunate enough to see these in person, there is a lot of different color underneath uh, each one of those layers of paint, and they, they simply vibrate. They seem to like come off the page. The first uh, influence that I alluded to, the idea of abstract expressionism, where the actual making of the painting, the marks that you make, um, you know, some people use their fingers and their hands, other people use their whole arm, their wrist. Um, you know, for me, it's very much a, 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 a full body experience. Maybe not quite so much as Jackson Pollock, who you know, danced around his canvases, uh, and the strains of paint, of course, became a record of his activity. But um, nonetheless, that idea of infusing the painting with uh, gesture is what I'm most interested in. So I thought that by seeing a couple of examples of things that have influenced me, they're very, very directly, or just kind of back in the back of my mind. Um, you might be able to look at the paintings now and see where some of those uh, influences come up. This, this work um, refers to a, a musical term, uh, omnis organa triplum. Uh, you know, music has its own history and all that, but oftentimes the adding of different voices and different pieces of, of instrumentation creates what they call like a horizontal development of music. With the organum, the idea is that you have layers of voices on top of one another, and so you get a, a vertical building of, of the music. And uh, so this is something that what we would associate with music coming out of Notre Dame Cathedral, for instance, in Paris. Uh, and I thought, boy, that really does capture so much of what I'm trying to do visually, the idea of the, of the, the layering and the motion and the movement um, of my activity, of my thought process. It was like uh, St. Mark's in Venice with multiple choir lofts facing each other and the notion of Renaissance polyphony in which these things uh, lap over one another and slide over one another and interact with one another. We got a great musician here and you know one of the things that's, well no, I mean one of the things that's in, in, nice to listen to is how, how in jazz how the, the, uh, the central theme is often uh, it's diverged from by each musician and then returned to and diverged from again. And uh, it's organic rather than uh, we turn, the, we turn the, uh, the page and we find, ah, there second I movement, go. ah, third movement. No, we, we have these organic um, uh, understandings uh, between musicians, much as, as your painting does that same kind of thing, one to the other. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that with the triptych and the, and the, the diptych that that, it, that you can see each panel on its own, but then you can also see it in a totality and that it invites some kind of back and forth. Um, this one, uh, Peripatia, that, uh, that turning point in the story. Uh, this, this particular triptych is perhaps the more adventurous of all the ones that I've painted because each panel really does stand quite separately from one another. Uh, but over the duration of viewing it, uh, as, you, as you kind of pick up certain elements, the orange line, the, the little um, green that seems to work itself in, um, I'm, I'm hoping that the idea is you can see an element and then see how it might transform or how it might mutate or how it might 
uh, have a different entity as it moves into another another world, another time, space and time.